All right, so welcome everyone uh, to our second Global Health Seminar in our Fall 2021 series. And today uh, we are very happy to have a very special uh, guest, uh, Dr. Amy Winter, who actually just joined us at the College of Public Health and is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology. She is broadly interested in characterizing and leveraging the complex interaction between human demography and infectious disease dynamics for disease control. Her current research focuses on exploring strategies for measles and rubella control and elimination, particularly using linked epidemiologic, epidemiological and serological data. Dr. Winter completed her PhD in demography at Princeton University and her MPH at Emory University. And today she's going to be talking to us about her work, uh, extensive work that she has done around uh, measles, infectious diseases in general. And the title of her talk is the whispered word, eradication. Will measles and rubella ever be candidates? So that's the title of her talk. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Amy uh, Winter to take over. Amy, you're welcome. Thank you so much for accepting to speak at this uh, seminar. And I, Great. I believe Thank you so much, Julia. I shared, be able to share your slides. Okay, perfect. Take questions at the end. So we'll let Dr. Winter speak for you know roughly 40 minutes and then we'll take questions and answer session at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, Hi everyone, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk at the Global Health Institute seminar. Um, as Juliet said, I'm a, I'm a new professor, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, my current work and then really just kind of the research questions I like to think about. And hopefully throughout the course of this hour we get to spend together, um, I'll learn some of your, your names and hopefully maybe some of your faces uh, if you pop your video on towards the end. Um, so like Juliet said, titled The Whispered Word, Eradication, Will Measles and Rubella Ever Be Likely Candidates? Um, one second. So we'll start off with a little bit of um, background and definition. So eradication of disease refers to deliberate effort uh, that leads to the permanent reduction to zero of a worldwide incidence of infection caused by a specific agent. And eradication of disease is, is global and it's hoped to be permanent, barring some sort of massive bioterrorism leaks. Um, and this is different from elimination, which is more of an achievement that's restricted to a specific geographic area. Like you can have elimination of disease at a country or a regional level. If it happens all over the world, then it's eradication. And this is also different than extinction. Extinction is when the pathogen or the agent no longer exists anywhere in the world. So to date, the World Health Org Organization has officially declared two diseases eradicated smallpox caused by the variola of minor and ma major viruses um, were eradicated and officially declared eradicated in 1980. And also render pest caused by the render pest virus was officially declared eradicated in 2011. Now smallpox, of course, because it's the only human disease known to ever be eradicated, um, is talked about a lot in terms of how easy it was to uh, recognize. It was characterized by these lesions, these pustules, this rash all over the body. And you can even look back, um, back 3000 years ago and see um, markings of like small pox like rashes on Egyptian mummies. The earliest known description of, of what they thought would have potentially been the uh, small, uh, smallpox disease appeared even in the fourth century in China. Um, now, the other two, well, maybe we'll talk about render pest first, actually. So render pest uh, is um, a virus in cattle and other mammals that are non-human. Um, its last known case was in Mauritania in 2003 and officially declared and eradicated in 2011. And render pest um, caused havoc, really, really havoc to a lot of different cattle farmers because sometimes that case fatality rate was as high as 100% in some outbreaks. So. Um, like I said, these are the two, on, these are only two diseases known to ever officially be eradicated. The World Health Assembly, though, has uh, 
set resolutions for two other diseases. In 1955, there was a World Health Assembly eradication resolution for malaria. And um, unfortunately, according to the most recent strategic advisor group on malaria eradication, um, malaria eradication is very far from reach. It continues to be. So it's not something I'll be talking about specifically today. Um, and then the third disease is polio. The resolution was set in 1988. And we have made uh, pretty remarkable strides um, in reducing and, and achieving elimination in most countries, um, but it remains endemic in two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. There was a recent win though. Uh, they believe uh, that the last endemic case of polio was recognized in, in, um, in Nigeria in this past year. So if that continues to be true, that will definitely be a win. So the reason that eradication is really a whispered word to date is because of polio. Every five or 10 years, there's a new report that comes out that says uh, polio is gonna be eradicated in the next five or 10 years and we're still struggling with it. Um, so there's been a lot more conservative efforts around or conservative thinking around even setting any sort of more resolutions. As you see, there's no more resolutions that's been set since 1988 when polio was set. Um, and people and the WHO and other international organizations are thinking a lot more about elimination. So elimination at the country level and the region level. Um, so what are criteria? What are criteria that make a disease a likely candidate for eradication? There's a ton of literature out there. There's a lot of people thinking about this, uh, particularly after smallpox was eradicated. There was a lot of uh, really excitement around, okay, what's the next disease that we're going to claim? Um, I think one of the probably most well-known sources for thinking about good criteria for disease eradication is the International Task Force for Disease Eradication set up by the Carter Center and um, sometime in the late 80s, and uh, it's still funded today by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and then in addition, there's just been a ton of papers and, and commentaries and whatnot speaking about what they thought were the best criteria. So I've attempted to synthesize this criteria today into five different aspects of, of feasibility of eradication, biological, technical, operational, political, and financial, and then social feasibility. And since we're particularly interested in talking about measles and rubella, I want to put or think about each of these criteria in terms of uh, these two uh, RNA viruses, measles and rubella. So um, there was a report that came out in 2011, uh, copied here at the top of the slide, that said that measles is biologically uh, feasible for eradication, um, meeting all five of these criteria. Um, rubella, on the other hand, uh, does have a little bit of a harder time because 40% of rubella infections are subclinical. So the ease at which you can recognize rubella is a little bit tougher, although there continues to be a very accurate diagnostic test for rubella, both uh, ELISA's and PCR's um, in order to capture rubella infection. So the biological feasibility has been argued uh, is definitely there for measles eradication, and I would argue is, is, is uh, pretty good for rubella. In terms of technical feasibility, this is really the availability of tools to achieve eradication. Um, so for measles and rubella, it really constitutes whether or not there's a low cost, safe and effective vaccine. And as you all know, uh, as probably most people in this seminar have, have been vaccinated for measles and rubella, probably using MMR vaccine or MMRV, there is an incredibly safe, cost effective and, um, and, and efficient vaccine. And there's also a, a accurate diagnostic tests that are available commercially at, at pretty good cost. So the technical feasibility is there. What about the operational feasibility? This relates to whether or not the technical tools can be applied or deployed effectively. So uh, for example, are vaccine strategies um, able to achieve the necessary vaccination coverage or is the surveillance system sensitive enough to capture respondent outbreaks? Uh, I gave these two, um, I, or I gave this, um, criteria uh, orange for, we're not sure yet. Um, there has certainly been case studies and examples where measles and rubella have both been eliminated from countries and even one region, the Americas region. But what does that mean for the rest of the world? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And the other two aspects we're thinking about eradication are really political and financial feasibility and then social feasibility. So I lumped uh, political and financial feasibility together because so long as number one is correct, so there's manageable expected cost of eradication, then it really just comes down to whether or not there's political will to spend money on that effort. And um, part of that political will uh, is based on a high 
perceived disease burden of, uh, of, of disease. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, but my, my red and, or my orange and green got a little bit mixed up. So measles should definitely be green here. Uh, measles has a very high transmissibility. Uh, it's very contagious. It also has a very high case fatality rate particularly among children who are malnourished or immune compromised, uh, case fatality rates can be ranged between three and up to 12%. Um, the perceived disease burden of rubella is not as high. Um, it's generally a mild infection among, among kids. And I'll talk a little bit more about rubella. Now, in terms of the social feasibility, uh, there's a lot of different factors you could consider here. I think for measles and rubella, the most relevant ones are what are the impact of vaccine refusal or postponement? And um, that's something that I also judged it with an orange, which is that it's unknown. Um, you know, vaccine misinformation, as we know, continues to spread. So uh, the overall impact of what that means for eradication is probably going to be region and country specific. Um, again, not something I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be focused a little bit more on the operational feasibility of eradicating these two um, diseases. So um, you'll see, again, just to, the, in terms of what are the operational feasibility, what we're really interested in is can vaccine strategies achieve the necessary vaccination coverage? And to understand what the necessary vaccination coverage is, we need a little bit of dynamics theory. Um, so there are two terms to introduce uh, for those of you who might not know. Uh, the basic reproductive number is the mean number of secondary infections that a primary infection produces in a totally susceptible population. So the figure at the top right shows a primary infection in red producing five secondary infections in yellow and a totally susceptible population. The effective reproductive number or R is similar. Um, it's, a it's the mean number of secondary infections that a primary infection produces, but it is in a non-naive or non-totally susceptible population. So in this particular instance, you might have immune individuals in gray, susceptible individuals in white, and your R in this population would be two. Um, now you can estimate R uh, most simply as equal to R naught times S, where S is the proportion susceptible. If we're thinking sort of in sort of a, a control uh, perspective, then S is also equal to one minus P, where P is the fraction of the proportion vaccinated. Um, what's nice about this uh, characteristic, um, this parameter R, is that it gives us, it tells us a lot in terms of control. So when R is less than one, we know that the number of infected cases will start to fall out and the epidemic will start to die out. Um, so from a control perspective, again, we want R to be less than one. So we can rearrange this equation on the right and solve for P to, um, cap to find the critical vaccination threshold, which is equal to one minus one over R naught. The figure on the left gives you kind of like some intuition about where this number comes from. So if you have an outbreak and you're starting from a totally susceptible population, so susceptibles are one, proportion one, uh, no infected. A new pathogen enters the population, you see an outbreak. Um, where the top of that outbreak uh, peaks, it, R was equal to one to the peak, and then um, after that peak, R is less than one. So it's that proportion at the top of that peak uh, that is actually the proportion that needs to be vaccinated in order to interrupt transmission because this is where R changes from above one to less than one. Just to give you a little bit of intuition again where this um, necessary vaccination threshold comes from. So that equation, uh, which is a very simple equation, there's a lot of assumptions there, it predicts that more transmissible infections are harder to eradicate. On the x-axis is the basic reproductive number, and the y-axis is that critical vaccine threshold. So for measles, which has an R-naught of about 15 on average, it can, it can range quite a lot, though. Um, this would mean the critical vaccination coverage is about 95%. For rubella, which is similar to smallpox, of an R-naught of 5, this would mean about 80%. So you can start to understand what some of these complexities might be. One, this assumes that everyone who's vaccinated actually seroconverts and is immune to infection in the future, which, is, which isn't true. The vaccine's not perfect. Um, two, just imagining vaccinating, effectively vaccinating 95% of the global population is uh, pretty daunting. So yeah, you can start to kind of get a, a sense of, of how, of whether or not this is gonna be possible. So let's talk a little bit about the current uh, state of measles in the world today. The measles vaccine was licensed somewhere in the, 19, the late 1970s or even mid 1970s in the US. 
Um, and since then, the measles vaccine has been introduced into every country in the world. And the vast majority of countries, 90, 90, at least 95% of the countries also have two doses of measles vaccine in their childhood vaccination program. So as a result of the vaccine, we've seen great reductions in the number of measles cases. You can see on the figure on the left. Um, in fact, between 2000 and 2019, uh, 25 million deaths have, have been estimated to be averted due to the measles vaccine. In 2018 and 2019, you may remember prior to the pandemic, it felt like a different world, but there was um, a bunch of headlines coming out about uh, measles outbreaks that are happening all over the world. There was a huge outbreaks happening in Madagascar, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Ukraine, and other countries. One of the more devastating things that also happened was that measles uh, endemic transmission was reestablished in Venezuela, and then um, I think in Brazil as well, but certainly in Venezuela at that time. So the Americas has lost our, our um, measles elimination status. The other thing that's happened um, since the pandemic is uh, there was a recent paper come out by Kazi et al. out of IHME in Seattle, who uh, estimated the nut that there's been decent amount of disruptions to routine vaccination programs as a result of the pandemic. Uh, these disruptions could be supply chain disruptions, um, just lack of movement of people going to healthcare centers, fear of going to healthcare centers, whatnot. Um, you know, healthcare workers also being obviously pulled to, to um, treat cases uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2. So this figure on the right shows the number of children that were estimated to be missing doses in 2020. Sort of that dash line is the number of children that would typically be missed on any given year. And anything above that is the number of additional children. So um, this is uh, aggregate numbers of cross countries and there's certainly heterogeneity across countries. Some countries haven't seen much disruptions and others have, but this kind of sets up what the current state of measles is to date, which is um, some rebounded cases in 2018, 2019, rebound outbreaks, and now that risk of uh, large schools is susceptible due to uh, routine vaccine disruptions. Now, what's the current state of rubella? Um, so as I mentioned uh, before, rubella's uh, burden is, is slightly lower. In fact, uh, rubella is generally a really mild illness when it, when it infects children. The problem with rubella is that if pregnant women become infected with rubella, it can cause fetal death or the birth of a child with congenital rubella syndrome, which is marked by a triad of birth defects, including um, deafness, blindness, and heart defects. So as I mentioned, uh, measles vaccine has been introduced in every country in the world, but rubella vaccine has not yet. The figure on the left shows that the countries in gray are those that haven't introduced, which is uh, 21 remaining countries. And if you look on the figure on the right, you see that that's where the burden of congenital rubella syndrome is the highest. There's estimated about 100,000 uh, annual cases of CRS a year. And because the measles vaccine is combined with the rubella vaccine, um, which uh, I think maybe I mentioned, or maybe I forgot to mention a couple of slides ago, um, the disruptions that are happening to the measles vaccine that I showed in the last slide are also happening to the rubella vaccine because they're combined. So those disruptions might still be occurring despite the fact that we've seen mass reductions in, in rubella over time. Okay, so should we, uh, should the World Health Assembly um, uh, set up a eradication resolution for measles and rubella? So this is a, a timeline that I attempted to put together um, that basically show that every single, there's six WHO regions of the world. Those are color coded on the bottom left hand of the slide. So all six WHO regions have set measles elimination goals. And four of the six have set a rebel elimination goal. And um, I really wanna highlight specifically the Americas region. So it's, uh, it's outlined in, in yellow for each of the times it's mentioned. So Americas I, I, um, was able to achieve measles and rebel elimination. Um, the last case of measles was in 2002, endemic measles in the last case of endemic rubella was in 2009, and then rubella and elimination were declared in 2015 and 2016 respectively. Uh, these were huge, vast efforts, uh, really mostly led by a, a PAHO chief um, named Circo de Cuadros, um, who was just a, a great leader in the region to, to make this happen. Um, so then in 2017, a delegate of PAHO proposed a resolution uh, goal at the 70th World Health Assembly for a measles and rubella eradication goal. You can imagine sort of the impetus behind this, right? All this effort's gone into eradicating measles and uh, rubella from the region. 
but the borders continue to remain open and measles anywhere is a threat to measles everywhere, which is what the CDC likes to say. Um, so eliminating measles is hard enough. Trying to maintain elimination is, is a whole nother beast because you're constantly having importation pressures of infected individuals. So by the um, Ameri uh, Pajo Delicate proposing this resolution, um, it was really also trying to safeguard kind of the, the, the strides that have been made in the region. So at that time, uh, let's see, the 70th World Health Assembly, the Director General requested a report back in three years on the epidemiological aspects and feasibility of and potential resource requirements for measles and rubella eradication. Um, unfortunately, the next, the next year is when endemic measles was reestablished in Venezuela. But uh, in 2019, a feasibility eradication report was delivered um, and uh, presented at the World Health Assembly. Um, and you can find that report online and you can find uh, the published paper that was published in vaccine this past year for a little bit more information. So just to kind of give away the bait, uh, <laughs> um, the, the feasibility report did not uh, recommend uh, eradication resolution for measles and rubella. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why and uh, particularly the role that um, me and my colleagues played in, in, think, in, in modeling some of the operational feasibility of that. So just to go back to the operational feasibility, uh, remember it's, are the tools deployed effectively? So more specifically, can the vaccine strategies achieve the necessary vaccination coverage? Um, in the Americas, there were two main strategies for vaccination that were used. The first is uh, making sure that measles and rubella were in the routine vaccination program. This is the childhood vaccination program. Um, it's probably what all of us, most of us have been vaccinated uh, through. In the United States, the vaccine schedule is at 12 months old, infants are vaccinated with MMR, and then again at four to six years old. So that's the routine schedule. The other opportunity for vaccine is via vaccination campaigns. So vaccination campaigns are these really large efforts where um, instead of vaccinating a birth cohort, like routine vaccination is targeted towards, uh, vaccination campaigns target a, a decent, a decently large age group, and they vaccinate that whole entire age group uh, over the course of two weeks or a month or something, uh, very very quickly. So a typical vaccination campaign would um, vaccinate all children between say ages nine months and five years old and a whole entire country. Vaccination campaigns are large, um, as routine vaccination programs or routine vaccination coverage increases, vaccination campaigns become less and less efficient at capturing children who had been missed by the routine vaccine. Um, so that's really the point is to capture children who didn't get vaccinated by that routine vaccination schedule through the childhood immunization program. Um, and the real goal of, or the real um, sort of output of vaccination campaigns in the end is you hope to have some sort of secession criteria so as routine vaccine coverage increases, the need for vaccination campaigns will become less and less. They are indeed less efficient at capturing children who've been missed. And eventually vaccination campaigns were stopped in the Americas, which is what's happened. So um, the question is, can we take these strategies, these two particular ways you capture children that were done in the Americas, apply them to other countries of the world? And would we see a similar um, impact of measles and rubella elimination in those countries? Uh, so the objective of this, of this particular work was to evaluate the probability of measles and rubella elimination in 93 countries across a couple of different vaccine scenarios. So the 93 countries here were chosen based on the countries that are having the hardest time controlling measles and rubella. Uh, two vaccine strategies were looked at um, created by the CDC. The one of interest uh, is the intensified investment or the II, and that's like the most optimistic scenario that CDC could come up with that was still potentially realistic um, of an improved routine vaccination coverage over time, and then the eventual cessation of vaccination campaigns. And then there was uh, five models that were run to look at the probability of elimination. There was two rubella models and then three measles models, one of which was subnational. And there's a little bit of information on the right-hand side about those five different models. Um, the main thing to know is that uh, most of them are compa compartment mo mechanistic models. Uh, the Penn State University is semi-mechanistic and the IDM model, which was subnational, is agent-based. So uh, what's the output? Um, ultimately, we found that uh, rubella eradication is not only possible, but it is probable using the same tools that were used in the Americas to eliminate uh, rubella in the Americas. So um, 
each sort of column of these figures represents a different model. The JHQ model, which is the one I led, and then the uh, Public Health England model on the right side. Um, at the top pan, that, that uh, heat map, so each row represents a different country, and the color represents the probability elimination, uh, and it's over time between 2020 and 2100. So this is giving you the probability of elimination over time for each country. If you look in figures C and D, you can see what the probability of elimination is for each country as of 2050. So certainly the, the model on the left, uh, our model is more optimistic than the model on the right. Um, I can get into different reasons for, for that, uh, particularly some sensory analysis show that a large differences were based on uh, introduction rates. Um, but overall, our takeaway from, from this work was that rubella eradication is probable. Um, now for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be focused on measles, but I really wanna caveat this, that even though it's probable, uh, given these incredibly uh, optimistic vaccine scenarios put out by the CDC given to us to, to model, um, it's not by any means easy. So it's still obviously gonna require incredibly sensitive surveillance. Uh, there's a lot of subnational heterogeneities that weren't considered uh, in these models, the nonlinear dynamics. So it's by no means easy, but for the sake of this talk, um, I'm gonna move on to measles and, and leave rubella there for now. So what about the operational feasibility of measles? Um, you can look at these figures the same way we did for the last for rubella. Um, now we have two different models coming from London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and then uh, Penn State University. And as you can see, the Penn State University is more pessimistic uh, than the model on the left from London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine. Um, another thing to notice is if you, if you look at rubella, typically once a country or every single country, once they actually achieve elimination, so turn blue, they don't typically turn back. Right, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty linear scale to, to elimination. On the other hand, for measles, you see sort of a lot of like switching from blue and then back to yellow or red, or from or from red to orange and then yellow and then back to red. Um, and this is ultimately what means that it is possible to achieve eradication, uh, or really in, in definitive terms, it's possible to achieve elimination in each of these countries, but it's improbable. And I'm just going to give you a little bit, sort of trying to give you some intuitive understanding for why this is. Um, so R effective is on our y-axis. Uh, I think I, I just called this R in the, um, in, the, in the third slide. So this is just our R. And on time is, uh, on the x-axis is time. So imagine an endemic transmission, vaccines introduced and you drop R less than one. So Routine vaccination um, is there. So you, you'll start to see sort of a slow increase in the number of susceptibles and therefore you start to see this uh, slow incline towards R effective of one, which is that sort of threshold that tells us whether or not uh, a population is primed for an outbreak or not. As routine vaccination increases, uh, the rate at which it takes that, uh, that number of susceptibles for that R to cross one gets slower and slower, right? So you have a vaccination campaign at the beginning which drops R effective back down that R continues to increase again as susceptibles build up, a vaccination campaign drops it back down again, um, and then an even slower build up because the routine vaccine uh, coverage is increasing. At this point, our criteria, maybe our succession criteria is met and we're no longer conducting follow-up campaigns. The time it takes for uh, enough susceptible children to build up is gonna take longer, but you still see that build up of susceptible individuals so that, such that R effective crosses one and the population is prime for another outbreak. And that's what was happening in these models. Uh, there was assumptions of introduction rates in each of the countries. So it didn't sort of matter how they were connected to their countries in terms of what the risk of importation was. Once our effective cross one, there was some sort of risk of an outbreak. So what do we do from this? Um, the types of strategies we use in the Americas are not necessarily gonna work for, the, uh, for these countries uh, really because mostly because of the secession criteria and the fact that the demography of a lot of these countries are a lot younger and there's a lot more births. Um, so what do we do? There's a lot of different strategies to come out of this, um, but a couple of the strategies or three of the strategies I'm gonna look at today of increase in operational feasibility for measles eradication um, can really be assessed by thinking about uh, infectious or measles transmission dynamics and, and using, using modeling. So the first is instead of having these routine uh, follow-up vaccination campaigns that are then uh, seized at some point or stopped at some point, what if we relied on some sort of trigger that would then uh, trigger a vaccination campaign when it was necessary so that they're still efficient at capturing um, susceptible children? 
So uh, this is a paper published by Lesler et al. Uh, in 2016. It's a really nice simulation study um, showing each plot represents a different population. So um, on the y-axis is cumulative cases, on the x-axis is time and years. So if there was no trigger of a vaccination campaign and our effective just continued to, to build up, um, then when an outbreak did happen, that would be the black line. So there'd be a lot of, a lot of cases. If we allowed a trigger vaccination campaign based on the number of um, measles cases, that's the red line. And if you allowed a vaccination uh, campaign that was triggered based on susceptibility, that's the blue and the green lines. And this is just proving the point that if you trigger vaccines based on susceptibility in children, you're going to reduce the number of cases that would occur in any given outbreak. And this is probably pretty obvious to most of you because of course, if you stop an outbreak before it really gets started, then you're going to reduce the number of cases. I mean, once the number of cases has hit 25, the outbreak's pretty well underway. But taking uh, the simulation study and sort of taking um, away the lessons learned, which is that susceptibility is a really good way forward, what do we do? Um, and in any sort of typical uh, disease dynamic as here in just an SIR model, the central process of infectious disease epidemiology is really that infection. Um, and only cases are directly observed generally. It's what we get in the clinic data. It's what we find in the fever rash surveillance data. The problem is that we want susceptibles. Um, you can indirectly infer susceptible and susceptibility uh, given robust data. So you can imagine if you had really, really good vaccination data, um, really, really good case data that allows you to estimate a force of infection and a good idea of what the vaccine efficacy or effectiveness rate was in a population, you could infer, move backward and sort of infer what susceptibility is in the, in the population. But this does require very robust data. And for a lot of the countries that we uh, still continue to struggle with measles and rubella and um, robust data is difficult to come by. So um, I think the answer really is using serology because it can directly estimate um, measles susceptibility. So serology is just uh, the, measure, the measure of virus-specific antibody in blood. And this particular instance, we're interested in measuring measles uh, virus-specific IgG antibody or immunoglobulin G, which uh, is a representative of acute, I'm sorry, is representative of um, immunity. So it tells you what susceptibility or what immunity is in the population. And it's, a, it's the most direct measure. Um, the problem with serology data and collecting it and generating it in, in a lot of uh, countries of interest is that it can be very challenging. Um, it's very expensive uh, for numerous reasons. One, in order to get a representative sample, you have to have a good sampling frame. You often have to make sure you, you capture uh, many individuals, of course, for it to be representative. It can be quite uh, time consuming and costly. You also need expertise in um, statistical analyses. You need lab expertise to analyze the, um, the data. And um, on top of that, there's always this issue of non-response because whether it's capillary or venous blood, you're still drawing blood and, and response rates are always um, difficult to capture. Or high response rates are always difficult when you're drawing blood. But there are a lot of opportunities, I think, to increase the feasibility of collecting these types of really rich data and I just given a couple of examples here. Um, one is expanding the existing surveillance system to include IgG serology. You can add IgG serology to other multi-purpose uh, household surveys or other or other Sarah surveys. And then one of particular interest, um, which is getting more um, a lot more attention now due to the technology, is relying on multiplex assays to basically just reduce the cost of any one pathogen test. Um, so the next two slides are really kind of case studies of, of how we can increase the feasibility of uh, collecting these types of data and use them for thinking about triggering vaccination campaigns. Uh, so this is an example from Madagascar. We worked with Institute uh, Pasteur de Madagascar um, and my former PI, Jess Metcalf, where uh, we use fever rash surveillance to um, net to we you pulled the residual samples from fever rash surveillance to also test for IgG uh, serology. So basically, what happens when a child or adult presents to care at a clinician with um, fever, rash, cough, cords, or conjunctivitis, where the, which are the symptoms of measles and rubella, um, blood is taken, serum spin down, and sent to a national lab 
where it's been tested for uh, measles uh, specific IgM antibody. So IgM antibodies uh, measures acute infection. So this is determined if the individual has measles or not. Um, if, if they're negative for measles, then they'll test for rubella. So after those samples are, are tested, they're stored in a freezer. They have backup generator and they've been stored uh, since 2004. So uh, again, working with the past two, uh, Institute Pasteur de Madagascar, we went back in, um, dethought about a thousand samples that were collected between 2014 and 2015 and retested them, but this time testing them for measles IgG antibody, which as you remember measures um, immunity. So the total population immunity was about 83%. Um, the figure on the top right shows that age specific immunity profile or seroprevalence profile. And you see there's a pretty good dip in immunity, um, tends to be pretty low, right around that age 10 to 15 years old. But overall, 83% uh, population immunity is certainly nowhere close to that critical vaccine threshold of 95%, which means that it, it, theoretically this population is at risk of an outbreak. Um, we did a bunch of simulations uh, here on the bottom right figure, or the bottom left figure, to, talk, to show what would be the needed um, target age group for a triggered vaccination campaign in order to uh, bring that R effective back down to one and reduce the risk of an outbreak. Um, so these results uh, were, were published and, and, and distributed um, um, in Madagascar and um, uh, through the Institute Pasteur de Madagascar. Um, and unfortunately, there, there wasn't a vaccination campaign that took place. Um, there was a plan one, but it, they didn't get it off the ground. Uh, WHO was working with them. Um, Anyways, a few years later, uh, in 2018, 2019, when we were having other global, uh, other outbreaks of measles across the world, there was a, a pretty devastating measles outbreak that took place. And when we um, looked, we, we went back and, and looked at how the age structure of the cases compared to our age immunity profile. So the figure on the top right shows the um, age specific seroprevalence estimates for each age group uh, by by the six provinces. And then the figure on the right shows the uh, age profile of cases. And you can see that for the three sort of darker colored provinces, so the dark red, dark green, and dark blue provinces where that gap in immunity is highest between the 10 to 14 years old, those are also the three provinces where you see a disproportionate number of cases in that same age group during the outbreak. Um, so this is one case study of an example of, of using residual samples, particularly the fever rash surveillance system, which is being conducted in every country in the world to test for also IgG antibodies that could give us some information about whether a vaccination campaign needs to be triggered. Uh, a second example comes from uh, Zambia. And this particular example um, uh, with uh, the Ministry of Health in Zambia and um, Principal Investigator Bill Moss at Johns Hopkins University, we nested a sero survey within uh, Zamfia. So Zamfia is Zambia's FIA, which are these huge, um, typically admin one representative um, HIV household surveys. Um, thousands and thousands of samples were collected in 26, uh, 2016 for this HIV household sero survey. Uh, the samples were stored in a viral repository um, we worked uh, in coordination with Ministry of Health and, and Columbia University to dethaw these samples and retest them for measles IgG antibody uh, titer. And the figure on the left shows the results of these of these um, of this testing. So, 83% of the population was immune to measles. Um, figure A shows the age profile of seroprevalence. Uh, you can see um, it's generally increasing across ages around age 20, 25, you see a dip and it increases again. Um, because this data was so rich and these residual samples were, you know, they were just sitting in this micro repository, we could test so many of them. Um, we have really good resolution at, at a spatial scale and we built a, I built a hierarchical spatial model um, in order to estimate measles seroprevalence at the district level. So this gives us some indication of not only can we trigger vaccination campaigns across the country, but as countries such as Zambia, who have really, really high MCV1 vaccination, although not as high uh, dose two vaccination, maybe it's possible that not everyone in the country needs a vaccination campaign. Maybe we can start doing some national vaccination campaigns, which is a pretty big um, effort of, of Gabby right now. 
So using this data, we can estimate uh, district-specific admin to seroprevalence. And you see there's a good bit of range um, in terms of what the seroprevalence is across districts. Uh, the lowest ones, you know, being that district right in the middle and Luapulua, Malinge. Um, but another thing to notice is that all the district seroprevalence distributions are still less than 90%. So um, they still are all at risk of a, 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 of a outbreak, um, assuming that critical immunity threshold of 95%. Um, the next thing that we could that we were able to do with this data and thinking about trigger vaccination campaigns is what did it mean uh, for the pandemic? So in Zambia, there um, there was in coordination with Ministry of Health, uh, we were interested in analyzing whether or not there was a disruption due to the pandemic and the routine vaccine program, and um, we uh, were able to empirically estimate there there was very actual little um, impact of the pandemic on on routine vaccine but we still looked at uh, our effective over time for these different, different districts. And despite the fact there was minimal disruptions, districts were still at risk of a measles outbreak. And in uh, November of 2020, there was a vaccination campaign conducted in Zambia uh, to try to reduce those risks across all the districts. No districts were left out because of the, the risk in every single district. Um, okay, so I, I kind of you know went off a little bit on a on a, a slight um, de detail um, about one way to increase the operational feasibility is by these triggered vaccination campaigns and serological data is I think uh, the data that's most um, promising in terms of, of, of informing those triggered vaccination campaigns both subnationally and across ages. But there's other ways, of course, to increase operational feasibility. And one of those is equity and um, improvements in routine coverage. So this figure on the left, uh, the only figure showing, sorry, um, it shows what, are the, what it means to have equitable improvements in routine coverage. So all the Nigerias on the left-hand side are, are the same. This is saying the national routine uh, immunization coverage is about 50%. Now, if you had equitable improvements in coverage, which is the top row of Nigeria's, you would see that um, even though the national routine immunization coverage is 80%, you see that it's pretty equal across, across different um, admin two levels in Nigeria. Now, if you had unequitable improvement, which is the Nigeria's at the bottom, um, you basically perpetuate the inequities that had already existed at the beginning even though national routine immunization coverage is 80% also in the Nigeria in the bottom right, it looks very different than Nigeria at the top right. And this is just a, a result of, of how you distribute um, improvements in routine vaccine coverage. Obviously, it's not easy to do this, um, but it's just making the point that um, if this is done, you have a much higher probability of elimination with equitable improvements than with inequitable improvements. Um, so this is one way to increase that operational feasibility uh, uh, across different countries that are struggling or, uh, to, have, um, to eliminate measles. So um, a, third, uh, um, a third sort of theory, or uh, I guess, not theory, but I guess a third um, avenue for increasing operational feasibility is by coordinating vaccination campaigns. Um, so I tried to kind of give some intuition here with some pictures. So imagine you have two different populations, populations A and populations B. And for population A, the vaccination campaign takes place towards the end of this time period when you see cases drop and our effective drop below one. Um, but in population B, it, it, uh, the vaccination campaign that dropped our effective happened earlier. So in this particular instance, um, because these countries are neighbors, there's going to be a high risk of importation from population A to population B. So once our effective crosses one in population B, um, because there's still transmission happening in population A, there's an imported case and, you, and it sparks an outbreak. Now, if you were to coordinate vaccination campaigns, you could actually um, increase the length of this grace period. So say population A uh, conducted a vaccination campaign earlier than that. Um, and population B, now when R effective crosses one, there's no cases in population A to then um, be imported into population B and place the pop and, and uh, push the population at risk of an outbreak. So even though R effective crosses one, without new infections coming in, the population is, is certainly at risk, but there is no outbreak that's occurring. So 
this is just like a miniature example of sort of coordinating vaccination campaigns, but you can imagine if you can do this across the world or certainly across the regions, you can kind of optimize um, how these vaccination campaigns are distributed um, and then extend this grace period so that the time at which you have to eradicate measles is slightly longer. Then this could be a really big sort of in-game type strategy for eradicating measles. And most of the work I've showed you to date, well, all of it that I've shown you to date so far is either published work or something that's been submitted and will hopefully be published soon. Um, this is just some work that I'm still working on, but it's a theoretical understanding of what that coordinated vaccination campaign might look like and how we might uh, optimize this, types of, this type of strategy across the world. So in this particular figure, I'm just showing the length of the honeymoon periods, which is when R effective is less than one. Um, across these different countries. And you could see there's a good range of, of differences. So Equatorial Guinea here on the bottom right corner has a really short honeymoon period so that are effective less than one uh, is very short. And that's because the uh, routine vaccination campaign coverage is quite low and because there's lots of births. Um, yeah, so this is still a work in progress, but I'm really excited about this project. So I just wanted to, to um, put it out there um, in case anyone's interested in talking about it. So um, that's the end of the talk. I'll just sort of do a, a quick refresher, a look back. Ultimately, uh, measles and rubella are decent candidates for eradication. Uh, bio, measles has already been shown to be biologically feasible for eradication, but no World Health Assembly eradication resolution was established due to the fact of these operational feasibilities and challenges. Um, using the current strategies that were uh, successful in the Americas, we found that rubella eradication is probable, but certainly not easy. And measles eradication is not probable. And in this particular talk, I talked through three different strategies to increase the operational feasibility of measles eradication, triggered vaccination campaigns, coordinated vaccination campaigns, and then equity and improved routine coverage. Of course, there's uh, certainly a ton more uh, public health type um, on the ground interventions for thinking about how to increase operational feasibility uh, that are being conducted by uh, countries and, and international organizations alike, including, for example, um, school entry uh, vaccine checks, um, working with healthcare workers directly to find children who've been missed by a routine vaccination program. The strategies I've introduced today are, are more just sort of um, um, strategies that can be scaled up across country um, from a mod and, and, and using modeling. And the last thing I just want to point out, um, although I realize kind of making this talk may not be as important to say anymore, but before COVID, it was still something I think to say, but serological data are very, very rich. And most importantly, I think that uh, residual samples can increase the feasibility of generating these data in countries that in, in the past haven't uh, generated these types of data because they're expensive and difficult to collect. Um, and what's interesting, and you know, SARS-CoV-2 and the pandemic has changed a lot about what we know about public health and epidemiology. And I think one of one of those things is um, just the, the use of residual samples and the reliance on uh, uh, serology to understand both past infection and what we think what's going to happen in the future. So um, yeah, maybe this isn't necessary to say anymore, but <laughs> I, I'll still say it. Um, okay, so that's the end of the talk. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Cody, you have a hand up, please go ahead. And, and please don't wait me to wait for me to call your name. Just um, once you have your hand up, go, go on and speak. That was just a clap one, but uh, I'll ask you a question anyways. Oh, okay, uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch the icon there. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, I was curious as, you know, the declaration from the World Health Assembly I kind of would anticipate that if they did declare some kind of goal uh, for eradication, that it would kind of spur maybe some positive feedback into kind of improving some of that operational feasibility that you were uh, discussing. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts towards that. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, Cody. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard that argument before that, that the goal is what will sort of create that political will to push that forward. Um, I mean, I agree. I think the World Health Organization hesitates to push forward eradication goals uh, because I think, you know, the struggles with polio. Um, 
isn't, I think goals are good. <laughs> so I think goals push people, uh, push countries and, and push our politicians to, 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 to set those, those agendas. And um, I don't necessarily like that hesitance uh, just because polio is struggling. So, so I agree with you personally, um, but obviously we just went through some of the struggles. Any other questions? Uh, I see Dr. Whalen does have a question. He has a hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Amy, thanks so much for your, your presentation. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'll try to, I'll try to be selective here. Um, and, you know, thinking back to the smallpox campaign, um, I know they, they were using sort of general population-based strategies for vaccination. And we had hit kind of this plateau or an asymptote. We were, we were there, but not close. We, we hadn't eradicated. And it really was the group from the budding CDC that went, I think, to somewhere in sub -Saharan, uh, Southern Africa. And they implemented this ring vaccination approach, mm -hmm. which was find the case, vaccinate the, their household contacts and then vaccinate those. Mm -hmm. um, have you explored any of that strategy for measles? Because mm -hmm. it, yeah. it, it meets a, some of the criteria. I mean, measles is not a subtle disease. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you almost don't need a diagnostic test for it when you see it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, that's a really good question. Um, so part of that, that last uh, strategy I brought up with the coordinated vaccination campaigns, um, kind of the, the idea behind that is that once you get in this state where every country, uh, if we can get every country where there are effective is less than one at the same time, I, what we kind of foresaw at that point is that that's when ring vaccination we thought might be actually useful uh, also for measles. Um, it's just like capturing those last cases and trying to just vaccinate every single person around them as quickly as you can. The generation time is slightly faster for measles, so you 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 know you might have to a slightly larger ring than you had for for smallpox. But um, I personally think that that is a, an effective strategy, probably towards the end game uh, for measles eradication. Also, yeah, and and that's actually when it worked for for smallpox as well. Mm -hmm. um, I my other my other comment was I um, uh, I. Uh, Sierra de Quadros used to come to Case Western a lot because he was friends with Fred Robbins and, and mm -hmm. others at the university. And I, I was fortunate enough to be in, in a discussion about measles eradication. Now, this is, this is a long time ago. <laughs> but um, th what they were discussing is, is sort of, um, and, and this gets into your policy feasibility issue. You, you, and, and I guess they were assuming there was a fixed amount of money. You know, if it's going to cost so much to eradicate a disease that's so infectious, is, is it going to rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak? Are you going to mm -hmm. diminish the capacity to control other diseases in a push to eradicate uh, measles? What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, um, I think that I probably skipped a talking point at some point thinking about the ethics of eradication. Um, I, a hundred percent. I think that that one, one of the books that I had recommended talks a little bit more about it. And, you know, at some point, and this is one of the arguments against polio eradication right now, right? The amount of resources it's taking to capture these last doses of polio, um, are, is it worth it considering how, the, how this money could be used for other people or other pathogens or, you know, even other humanitarian crises? Um, it's really, I mean, that's why I'm glad I'm not a politician sometimes because making those comp making those choices is very, very complicated uh, and difficult. Obviously in the long game, it's it's the benefits of eradicating uh, pathogens or eradicating diseases from pathogens is incredibly important. Um, but in the short game, those types of cost benefits are really critical for thinking about for particular countries and regions. So I don't have a good answer for you, Chris, except I think it's it's an ethical question for sure. Yeah, and, and I know that for polio, the governments got out of it pretty early, you know, mm -hmm. and put it into the private sector and mm -hmm. kudos to um, uh, Rotary International to really right. maintain that campaign. And, and, and then along, you know, Bill Gates and his foundation have 
among others, I think have really sustained the ability to do it and not individual governments so much. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't see that happening for, you know, a long list of diseases. So, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Well, thanks, thanks for a great, great, wonderful talk. Really, really yeah, nice. Do, do we have any more comments and questions? Please go ahead. We have a few minutes. I see Susan. Go ahead, please. Building off of Dr. Williams' question um, or comment on the different organizations that are involved with measles and rubella eradication, which ones are they? You mentioned the Carter Center. Um, was that, that right? Yeah. Um... The Carter Center has been really prominent in sort of setting up the criteria for eradication. They're not so prominent in the measles and rubella world. The, the big players in measles and rubella are Gavi, Gates Foundation, WHO, UNICEF, Red Cross, CDC. Um, and those are, those are really the, the big players right now. Would you talk to one of them? Like, for example, like, would you consult with one of them for about this topic or who would you like present to usually? Yeah, so the strategic advisory uh, working, their strategic advisory group for measles and rubella, they meet yearly and they have a working group. Um, and those big players um, join annually to talk and continue to have conversations about how to move forward uh, to control and eradicate measles and rubella. Um, I have been fortunate enough to have been invited to um, two of those strategic advisory um, meetings and present some of this work, um, but. Yeah, the, those are the, the strategic advisory group meetings is, is where a lot of this conversation is happening. So like NGOs, a lot of them? Uh, yeah, international organizations. In, international NGOs, okay. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Hey. Oh, it's okay. Uh, so just a quick question. Um, what do you think is right now is the biggest factor hindering the eradication of polio? And do you think that any of the measures that you talked about that could help with the eradication of measles with increasing the effectiveness of the operational strategies? Could those also be used with the polio eradication program? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And uh, it's it's certainly outside my area of expertise. So I'll, I'll answer it the best I can. But if anyone else has as better expertise, uh, I, I'll ask you to please speak up. Um, so polio is tough. Um, I mean, I think one of the main things we have to think about right now, because the two endemic countries that it remains in is now Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, with what's going on politically in Afghanistan, that's, that's immediately going to make it more difficult for polio vaccinators to come in and, and do their jobs um, when there's instability in a country. So I think that's one thing that's playing out. Um, in terms of can polio learn lessons from measles, I think it's the other way around. I think measles can only learn lessons really at this point from polio. Um, they've made, they've just run into every single issue possible <laughs> on how to like do those last end games to actually eradicate the disease. Um, so yeah, I think as much as we can look to polio it's probably gonna be the, the direction of, of, um, of knowledge. But it, maybe Chris, and uh, it sounds like you also know a decent amount about polio or others, if, if y'all wanna hop in, I'd, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts. Yeah, nothing, uh, I, I know that that in, in many of the countries, you know, Nigeria and some others in Africa, there's this, and, and you alluded to it in Afghanistan, the eradication campaigns are interfered with by political events. and. In, in uh, Northern Nigeria, it was Boko Haram that, and some mm -hmm. of the cultural beliefs about vaccination that, that prevented some of the widespread you know, vaccination needed to reach the herd immunity of what uh, 95%. So I, I think that uh, sometimes our best efforts are, are thwarted by political issues. Thank you for your question. Thank you. All right. It looks like we've come to the end of our time. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Winter for such an excellent talk. You can use the hand icon or you can just <laughs> have your mic open. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Winter, for a very, very informative talk. And thank, thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you uh, next month. Thank you, Juliet. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.